Hi, everyone. Hi, Tara June. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. I'm good. I'm very good. Um, I'm going to start by acknowledging before we begin that I am talking to you from Noongar Buja. I'm in um, the land currently known as Perth. Um, and I want to acknowledge that the the country on which I am talking to you from always was and always will be um, Wajak land. Um, the last time we were together, we were actually on this in this place together. Um, and so it's fantastic to see you all the way on the other side. Um, you're just outside Paris, right? Yeah, a couple of hours, just outside. <laughs> For people in Australia, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's wonderful to, to have you on the line with us. I wanted to start by just doing a quick introduction of you so that we get that stuff out of the way. We're gonna talk for about 25 minutes um, and then we'll open up for questions because um, there's tons of people that I can see on the side. Um, I'm gonna try not to be distracted by all the comments and excitement um, on the side of the panel. Um, so Tara June Winch is an exceptional novelist. She is the author of two books, Swallow the Air and After the Carnage, um, both of which won awards and were critically acclaimed. Um, her father is from the Wiradjuri Nation in what is known now as um, Western New South Wales. And she grew up in the coastal area of Wununa um, within the Wollongong region. Uh, she often explores the two geographical places um, in her fiction. Um, and Tara June is currently um, based in France. And we are here to talk about the award winning, though I know it's not important um, in some ways, but it kind of is in other ways. Um, the, the winner of the Miles Franklin Award um, for this year, which is the Yield. Um, so firstly, congratulations for that, but more importantly, uh, congratulations for an incredible book. Thanks, it's okay. It means a lot. So I wanna start with um, the way that all conversations seem to be starting these days, which is just a question about how you're doing and what this sort of strange period has been like for you mm -hmm. in the last few months since we last saw each other in February. Of this year yeah yeah i think um i think at the beginning because we went into lockdown the first week of march just after i saw you and then went straight to adelaide festival and then just yeah a couple of days later we were in lockdown here so i think at the beginning um after the sort of panics period um i had all these sort of i think as a lot of artists and writers did had these great sort of grand ambitions of what I was going to do with this um, sort of universal solitude, the fact that the world had shut down around me, not just a writerly solitude, but um, a societal solitude. And then that just went, that just crumbled, went to the wayside. And it's just been, as, as, as it's been for a lot of people, I think, um, sort of sense of mental and emotional survival more mm -hmm. than anything. Um, so, yeah. It's been hectic. It's been hectic just to, just in an ordinary day. Mm. Um, so I think there's, I think for a lot of writers and artists and um, sort of crafts people, people who are used to that solitary confinement in any case, who have now, had, you know, taken on that um, burden of having their sort of private space invaded with family and, um, and the entire world sort of burning. It's important to be a little bit more gentle um, mm -hmm. on, on expectations. I think that's when my mental health has been best, is forgiving, yeah. being forgiving. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How about you? Yeah, it's been um, same thing. Um, and of course, you know, in Perth, it's been incredibly. Um, it's the one time when living in the most isolated city in the world really feels like it's counted as a pro. Um, yeah. And so in many ways, looking at everyone else in the rest of the world, it's felt a bit like survivor's guilt. Um, right. Uh, because there has been, you know, very little community transmission, no community transmission here. And it's been beach and being able to go outside and take advantage of great weather. Um, yeah. But you're right that the sense of having, um, suddenly all this time and yet and yet no time to write and no time to think right. because yeah. the house which is wh where i usually write is suddenly invaded by all these people called my family 
mm. who, whom I love, but in, in smaller doses than this. So yeah, yeah, it's a very strange time. Yeah. I definitely think survivor's guilt is correct for a lot of people that are in the center of the cities as well. You know, we left Paris a couple of years ago and there we were in, you know, a, a predominantly 90% migrant community just on the outside of the prefecture. Um, and, you know, living on top of each other, eating and sleeping in the same room mm -hmm. as a child and remembering that we were able to leave there and we left there ironically because we couldn't afford Paris anymore, you know, and are in the remote countryside where we're now so privileged to have this sense of space. So guilt is a constant um, battleground. Yeah, it sure is. Um, Tarjuna, I want to talk about the yield because as we talk about time, <clears throat> one of the things that really struck me when I read this book the second time, um, I read it last year and I gobbled it up. Like I, I kind of breathed it in. It was one of those books that I couldn't put down because in some ways, even though the writing is so lyrical and beautiful and it's about this small town, um, it is kind of, the pacing is interesting. It's kind of a fast paced book because there's an action there's an action to it, right? There's a there's an end point that we're, we're trying to reach because we've got to save this town, we've got to save this property and this house. Um, and yet, rereading it again, I felt like there's a really beautiful, slow and lovely pace to it. And that there's a time moving backwards because the structure of the novel is in three voices, for those of you who haven't read it, the structure of the novel is in three voices. Um, one is Poppy, um, who's, an, who's an old man who dies right at the beginning of the book, so it's not a giveaway to talk about that. Um, and he's been um, writing in a dictionary. And so the entries that come from him are all in dictionary form. And then there's the voice of August, who's very contemporary. He's sort of, you know, she's 30, 29, 30. Um, yeah. And then there's um, the voice of, of the missionary, um, Greenleaf. Um, and um, and that's a sort of old voice, but again, it's in letters rather than in in sort of his own his own sort of speaking voice. Um, and so it crosses time in this really interesting way. But in some ways, rereading it, I feel like it is about time. Um, yeah. So I wanted you to read the first three paragraphs of of the book um, because I think it gives us a sense of what I'm talking about. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about about time. Okay. First of all, though, you were one of the earliest people to actually reach out and say, you know, this book meant something to you. Um, and it was such a beautiful, heartfelt, long letter to Zonke. Um, and when and at the moment, I'm rereading Always Another Country, your memoir. And there's something really fascinating. And I wonder if it spoke to you because of this re reason is the way you're writing is, I, I don't know if you feel this, but quite similar. Mm. I know it's a memoir. Maybe that's why I love you so much. <laughs> yeah. but, but honestly, everyone who's on here has to go and read this memoir, um, this story of exile and this incredible childhood and returning to South Africa at 24 and just to Sanke's incredible story. But there's this pacing that you have and you, you have this patience for the story. You're able to completely slow down time. As as you, you, you're a master of time in this in this memoir. I don't know if anyone's ever said that to you about this. No, memoir. but thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, and I'm keen to talk about your book. So okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to read the beginning? Okay, so right at the beginning. I was born from there. <clears throat> I was born on Nuremberg. Can you hear it? New rum bang. If you say it right, it hits the back of your mouth and you should taste blood in your words. Every person around should learn the word for country in the old language, the first language, because that is the way to all time, to time travel. You can go all the way back. My daddy was Buddy Gondawindi and he died a young man by the hands of a bygone disease. My mother was Augustine and she died an old woman by the grip of, well, it was an old world disease too. Yet nothing ever really dies. Instead, it all goes beneath your feet, beside you, 
part of you. Look there, grass on the side of the road, tree bending in the wind, fish in the river, fish on your plate, fish feeding you. Nothing is ever gone. Soon, when I change, I won't be dead. I always memorise John eleven twenty six. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And yet life rushed through and passed me as it will for each person. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about this sense of how this um, book moves through time and whether that's something you did on purpose or whether that's something that you um, that happened as you were as you were writing in the writing like was 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 the book about these characters or was this book yeah. about time and you and you put the characters into this timescape i think the book was about about was about time oh god it's hard it's hard it's hard when you're a writer and i haven't watched enough writers in interviews when they're reflecting back on a process that was so long, you know, over a decade, mm. and then to, you know, to be completely honest about an intention that mm. is that can change with every time you sit down at the page. Yeah. So the thing that drove me through that time and ploughed toward, you know, um, to, toward finishing this piece wasn't the characters. It was the philosophy that had to end the truth that had to um, be told and how history kind of, um, how history sat upon the surface of a country and seeped so deep into sort of gullies of water and stone. So it was more um, sort of gathering the symbolism of of history on this piece of land, history and the land sort of inescapable from each other. And in that way, time was revealed, you know, that um, that um, sort of essence of how to tell this story, this story of, you know, genocide, of colonialism, of deep time, of an, an ancient culture, an ancient language. And so the thing how I, the, the time was, you know, that, um, and, and landscape and history, what mm. I was sort of saying, it all um, sort of became um, ingredients in the one recipe. Mm. So in order to tell the, tell the story um, of that history, I needed to tell this, this, I need to tell time in so many complex ways I need to tell the time the sense of dream time where the past and the present and the future all exist in the now and how I would present that which is in Poppy's voice mm. and then I would have to I knew I'd have to jump that up against because I had to tell the true whole history and so I had to talk about um, <clears throat> truth from a colonial perspective from a white perspective Mm. because they those truths existed on the same piece of land and were the predominant sort of voices for a period of time during the stolen generations and you know that head of colonialism mm. so um having copies of the dream, dreaming story um dreaming sense of time within his story where time is sort of malleable you go back and forward um but you're always still in those 500 acres of land where the whole novel is set I needed to have those jutting up against cold hard facts, mm. um, dates, you know, mm. um, um, immutable truths that uh, the Reverend constantly referred to, right. um, numbers, references. And then, of course, there's August the third narrator, who's um, the only voice that's sort of propelling the story forward, that first person narrative. And I think she, in some ways she's caught between those two worlds. It's interesting because I wouldn't, I, I think at the beginning, she's certainly caught between those two worlds, which is why she runs away, which is why she goes to let, like she, she needs to get out of Prosperous. Um, but she also finds herself 
um, comfortably in those two worlds. Like that, that the story is really of her coming to accept that she lives on, in those two worlds in a way that doesn't um, doesn't feel uncomfortable to her. Yeah. Um, she's one of my favorite characters um, that I've come yeah. across. And I heard you in an interview saying to Melissa Lukachenko that she was really hard to write. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about why she was so hard to write because she feels um, fully formed the minute you meet her. Yeah, I think was it the conversation we had at Byron? Maybe no, you heard but, it wasn't. No, it was a conversation. It, it was a conversation you'd had in, at the Sydney Writers Festival. So it was just a long, okay. just the two yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Melissa's view of August was she sort of opened my eyes to what August was. I don't think. I think it's taken me a long time to actually be honest about who she is as a character and what her purposes and as you say like whether or not she did straddle those two worlds um those two narrative worlds melissa thought she had a psychosis actually hmm. um oh, interesting. interesting and that that whole um the way she ate her relationship hmm. with the land and food and her sort of um, ability to have this sort of x-ray vision um, hmm. of society and of the family and and, and the land in a way. She was difficult because it's so, um, it's it's my story, it's my sister's story, it's my children's mm. story. I think that's mm. why it's difficult because it's mm. a painful thread and because she was experiencing um, through the book, at the beginning of the book, especially Nyaran, you know, this Rajri concept of, um, weakness, hunger, and depression at once. You know, she's sort of uh, overcome by Nyaran. Mm. And I think that I, in the process of writing this book, I had undergone Nyaran because of the, you know, the history I had to look at and sort of the research that I had to um, constantly be immersed in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Um... Does that answer about August? It does. It does. It's it's interesting to think about her as um, the way that Melissa talks about it because that didn't occur to me, and and I wonder as you were saying that and as you talk about her and the and as I think about how she lives, I wonder how much of um, Wole Shoinka, uh, who was your mentor, and how it feels in some ways. It did. It felt like a, a book that felt very much at home. Uh, because African ways of thinking and being often are not one dimensional, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I wonder, I, 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 it did not occur to me that it might be psychosis. It just occurred to me that, that she was incredibly sad and that she was in grief and that that grief had not left her and it would not leave until we resolve the question of Jeddah, right? Like with that, right. that yeah. Like the idea of the chi, um, chigozi. Um, Obiyama. Obiyama. Yeah, he talks about the chi, and I and we've talked about that in conversation. And I think she has that um, that other dimension. The chi is the sort of spirit um, entity that lives with a person. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and that takes yeah. a long time. Yeah. Um, you talked about. Uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tarajin. I was going to say there's the complexity of her. You know, um, her seeking an identity also in the paternal colonial home, which is something that she grapples with, is that distance that she's had from her homeland and sort of trying to form an identity, um, yeah, in the, in, in the colonial breast or um, in the false idea because she doesn't have representation and because um, of the ghosts that live there, the ghosts that live on those 500 acres too. So I think her as a, as a, as a spiritually and in her essence, it's, it's Nyaran and her, um, her burden and her, and that narrative device that works through the story that's able to compel both the other threads into a full, fully fledged whole um, mm. is is a sort of 
quest journey of the self. It's more, yeah, mm. that she has to come home to herself. She does. That's a beautiful way of describing it. She has to come home to herself, which is what so many of us have to do, right? It, it, it doesn't matter right. what your position, um, but that, that layer of having been a colonial subject and having to think through this other thing makes it um, harder to do. Um, I loved, and I hadn't really paid attention to it as much the first time around, um, there is this real complexity in what this book does, and yet it's written in ways that don't seem complex, which is a, a skill. Um, someone on the side is asking whether you your writing is more intuition. Like, are you trying to do technical things as you're writing? Um, or yeah, is it is it more intuition or is it craft? Uh, <clears throat> or both? I mean, it's obviously both, but how, how much no, are intuition. you driven by intuition? Yeah. Oh, for sure, because I had never studied writing, so it can't be the craft. Um, <laughs> you know, it would, it's more that I'd feel uh, what resonated to me um, that was necessary to tell this story and read it aloud a million times and hear if it's mm. sung. Mm. Um, and, you know, reading other texts, especially I've always been influenced by lip song lyrics and poetry. Mm. Um, that's sort of my informal university in, in books like mm. in song and books. Yeah. Um, and so I would learn from, from song and, and poetry as I went along sort of te technical ways of telling a story. Right. But 100%, uh, not 100%, 80% intuition, 20% yeah. trying to be um, innovative or innovative in the way that I don't particularly like novels. Mm, interesting. Non-fiction or memoir, um, poetry, song. And so I wanted to write a novel that, would be would sort of satisfy all those elements and particularly not fiction i wanted it to be i wanted the reader to i wanted myself to learn something you know to unpack our history and this language and i wanted the reader to really learn something i wanted it to be useful um you know like a handbook that you would like a like a guidebook for for country that you would carry wow. around or, and then for for our mob reading it, especially Wiradjuri mob, I wanted to um, present, you know, a a guideline for claiming native title in a way. Yeah, it was wow. So I've never heard of a writer of fiction say that. Like I, I think that's really really interesting because you know, fiction is the is the king and the queen and the and the bee's knees, right? Fiction is the is the height of writing. And then all of the rest of us are stepchildren. And so to yeah. hear a writer of fiction talk about, and then you feel it in the book, it is such a, it's, it's beautiful and lyrical and poetic. And also I'm like, let's go. Like I read this book and I'm like, this is such a beautiful, and I think I said this when I wrote to you about this book, this is such a, this is something that is a, is a, is a, is a gift. It's a gift back to a community, which is incredible. Yeah, that was intentional for sure. Mm. And I wouldn't put, and that's funny, like it is true. Fiction is sort of at the, at the top. I put poetry up there first. Yeah. And then like really good memoir, really good nonfiction. I think that the, I think that the publishing, I think the publishing industry might differ with you when it comes to um, advances right. and contracts. Yeah. Follow the money. <laughs> it's not the right way to be, but follow the buddy. <laughs> um, I want to talk because I think this part of what is so difficult about this moment we are living in right now with not just COVID and how it follows the inequalities and takes us to the worst places, the worst fractures in our society, but also the, the new conversations that are happening about Black Lives Matters globally and what racism means and going back to colonization, questions that you've always explored and that we've always talked about, right? But part of what's, um, part of what's di especially difficult about right now is that it can feel like we're having these conversations about abstract, very big, very old things. 
that aren't embedded in our bodies. Right. And the way that you write um, August and Eddie's relationship, I just thought that was really genius um, because the secrets, what he knows, um, what he's withheld from her family, what he says when you scratch the veneer, and yet their intimacy and what they share and how much they love each other. Wow, like this is really, it felt like in many ways that was like the nub of this, this relationship between indigenous Australia and white Australia, whatever those two separations may actually mean, like that, that felt really profound to me in rereading it. Yeah, it's strange. Um, it's been difficult it's to, um, there's sort of two questions there. It's been sort of, on one instance, we've been writing about this, I've been writing about these issues that have come to the fore now about um, truth-telling and reconciliation, reparation and Black Lives Matter. On the one hand, I've been writing about it, and on the other hand, I am a benefactor of white privilege because of the colour of my skin. So for me, when Black Lives Matter um, came to the fore recently, my first, and then also seeing, you know, um, white celebrities and, and white media's kind of, sh and, and our politician, our prime minister, um, sort of shutting down that movement because it didn't exist in Australia. You know, I saw a white celebrity sort of saying, ladies, go out and get your nails done. Um, so much easier to watch people die with a good manicure. Oof. And this is like a major celebrity in Australia with, you know, and a lot of the commentary was, oh, oh great. like, great, let's go and get a manicure, ha, ha, ha. It was really um, perverse and dark. Mm. I think the mainstream Australia really, um, they really worship that altar of celebrity, white celebrity, and that was super scary. Um, that was, you know, it was hor horrific for me. And But then because of that position that I'm in, all I could do is just wanting to um, amplify Indigenous voices into that mainstream conversation with the Chair of the Mic Now Australia. Um, and pushing, you know, my titters and bros who are on the ground who deal with actual um, physical um, racism mm. on a daily basis to push those voices into the fore. Um, and, you know, what really emerged, I think, is the fact that, you know, I know we're going off tangent slightly, but the fact that I think... Um, we're going to have this, we're seeing it now, this black consciousness movement in Australia, especially within literature and mm. art and activism. I don't know if you agree, Sasanke, but it's, it's exciting seeing Ziggy Ramo, you know, on Q&A the other week, the way he articulated his song and his position as a black man. Mm. Um, Maine Wyatt on Q&A, oh, his monologue. Oh, that was that. That was incredibly powerful. And Teela Reid, who's just one of, um, she's going to bring out a book through Mugabala, um, Sharina Clanton, um, Nessa Turnbull Roberts. These are, like it make, gives me goosebumps. Yeah. We are having a movement and these yeah. politically-minded, <clears throat> really strong, proud yeah. Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, Torres Strait Islander youth on the street in community in touch with their language and their people are leading this absolutely um, and what I think we're going to have this black consciousness movement that we've seen you know our literature was born out of that South African activism was born out of that happened in black America and I think we're going to see um real vociferous um you know, articulate, um, angry, like heartbreaking, you know, earth shattering literature coming out in the next five years. That's when people have been asking, what's on the horizon for Indigenous yeah. literature? It's, yeah. The horizon is an earthquake. It's so big. <laughs> <laughs> like if I can do anything, it's lift them up in some way. Yeah. Like, you know, put a hand it's out. True. It's, it's true. Like, in terms of 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, you tell me what's going on. No, no, I was just going to say it's true. I could just completely validating what you said. And, okay. and I wanted to go back to that part of that question because what you do so well in this book is to think about the complexity of those issues and to make it tangible in relationships. Because I think part of what a lot of people struggle with is saying, okay, yeah, Black Lives Matter, but I'm not personally racist. I never did anything bad to someone, right? There's that, there's a real ability and a genuine way in which people think that. So I really love the way that you grapple with the layers of, even now as you're responding to this question, you're saying, yes, this stuff is amazing, but I have white skin privilege, even though I'm black, right? This is the complexity of Australia. Like it's, it's complicated. And I think anyone who tries to to suggest that it isn't complicated is um, is not doing justice to the work that we all have to do collectively. Um, and part of what happens in the yield is a real grappling with in that relationship. You see it in many ways. Yeah, there's a lot of truth telling and honesty in this book. You know, Aunt Missy. There's you know, there's a lot of stuff that's really interesting. But that relationship between this white man Eddie um, and yeah. August who are intimate and love one another, and yet um, the history of his family and what they've done in that right. community, what they've hidden, is, you can't run away from that. Yeah, he's in a position of power, even the, in, even the physical way that the Southerly House is situated on that farmland, that, that country on that ancestral land that had then been um, pastoral reserve station, um, mission, uh, mission station and pastoral reserve within his family for 99 years, farming family. Um, even the position of Southerly House being higher above the old mission church where they live, um, the sort of the way they tend the garden compared to how the Gondawindis tend the garden and, and tend to the land. Mm. Um, he, his privilege is... And, and yet they are, they've grown up in a place and shared an experience of a place in a country town. So, you know, in a country um, setting, you know, with motorbikes and That's right. wild, wild kids and going down to the river and that kind of joyous right. free um, connection, con connectivity to a land that's, you know, typical Australian upbringing in a sense. Um, but he has the power of his history versus her um, her oppressed history. His voice has been lifted while hers has been oppressed, you know, that through through generations. And that's his privilege. And with that privilege, he's able to, although they are intimate in in a way, and yeah. there's tenderness in because of that position that he or has always held and that his parents held and his grandparents held, he's able to injure her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's able to injure her. That's such a, again, it's such a beautiful way of putting it because I think when we talk about these really hard questions of racism, what we often forget is that what we're talking about is injury. Mm. That it's really, a, that, that we're talking about painful things and that, um, and I think the word in, injure, and I'm very mindful of this at this moment, you know, with all this, you know, stuff around racism, is that the word that um, that you use in the opposite of injure is heal, right? That mm -hmm. that, that they go together, and that you can't talk about what's next unless you acknowledge the injury and the and the hurt. And there's a way that the yield grapples with hurt and difficulty that's really complicated and truthful because it's complicated, right? right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I didn't want to be dogmatic with the truth. <clears throat> yeah. I wanted to slowly reveal it in the layers of, of, of time and how, um, for instance, you know, the, the Reverend talks about the doling of, of blankets for the, for the during um once a year once year, once yearly doling of blankets for um the Aboriginal community of of those this um dust bowl of the interior you know this this um pastoral kind of damned land and then 
at the same time, it's just sort of a throwaway observation and, and, and the newspaper has said, you know, the, um, the, the, the lords, the ancient lords, that there'll be no need to dole out blankets for the ancient lords will be, you know, as uncommon as an Aborigine on the streets of Sydney. Mm. And then in another thread, you've got Poppy um, time travelling and the ancestors that have got blisters on their mouths and their eyes and their hands and their feet, not from eating hot things straight from the fire, but because of gul gum gul gum, which is smallpox. Mm. Uh, and talking about how it, it was the old people and the young people, but particularly the old people who still had things to say that were taken too early, who still had truths to tell, you know. Right. There were stories in their mouths that never that um, never got communicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's the, and then, of course, you know, um, I think that crosses over with August's narrative going to the museum and her um, and that, um, you know, really, um, what's the word? I lose all my English words because I live in France. Um, <laughs> um, her confrontation with mm, seeing, yeah. seeing the possum skin cloaks, cloaks that were etched with Recognition. Her. Yeah. Yep. So I wanted it to... I wanted you to be able to read it a few times and to see those layers um, yeah. and to piece it to get do the work, you know, and I can see, I see reviews online where the, a certain type of person um, will just go, I couldn't get into this talk. Who are they talking, <laughs> you know, and I just think it's okay. Um, but there's other people that have really put in the effort. The to work. Yeah, it's work. It's hard work. And I've said um, that about us as writers as well, Indigenous writers, is, um, and, you know, and the fact that we're now having a readership. You could never imagine being on Dimix Chapter 1 mm. five, five years ago, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, and having this, you know, major readership and why it's taken so long and why it's still, you know, a battle, it's because it is uncomfortable. There's a sense of self-protection when Australians read our stories because it dismantles everything that they believe in, that they've been taught to believe in, all those storybook lies and history book lies. So there's a reluctance to read our stories and I think in the same way there's a reluctance of us to write these stories because it's painful to revisit. It's hard. It's very hard, but it's also harder. I think. I think you know. One of what's becoming apparent is that it's harder to continue to postpone it, right? Yeah. That it yeah. it only it only pushes us further apart, and it only makes the pain harder, and it on, only makes this society more brittle in a way yeah. that it doesn't have it doesn't have to be. You know, Australia is not America. They're not three hundred and fifty million people in this country. The ties are much yeah. closer in this place. Yeah. Um, and the history is much nearer because right. of how how resilient that memory, how strong that memory is of Indigenous people across nations in this country. That is the one thing that is so apparent is that those memories are so strong. Um, so there's a real yeah. opportunity. There's a real opportunity, I think, in listening oh, to these sure. stories. Yeah, apathy is the virus, isn't it? Sure is. Apathy is a virus. That is a very good way of putting it. Um, one of the things that I really love about the yield is the fact that it honors old people. Um, you know, I think it's um, Poppy is this incredible character, but so are all the old people and old ways of knowing and 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 doing and being. The relationship with her aunts is just absolutely gorgeous. There's a the m many of the finest moments in the book live in the interactions between um and so i appreciated that about it as well it's just right. beautiful dialogue beautiful dialogue oh it's so hard to write dialogue it is it is yeah, but it makes sense when you say that when you say that you the singing and oral it, it right. sort of affects the way you write mm. yeah i had to, the dialogue would have to be read aloud and sort of sung aloud even 
it had to multiple multiple times to get that right but then it's true to life you know um I honor my father I honor my um aunties my uncles my grandparents you know and I think it's true to life in the way that um all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um honor their old people Mm. this um this moment this moment has been interesting. I was reading an, a, a study um, a few days ago for some work I'm doing separately. And they said that across Australia, only 60 indigenous people, six zero indigenous people across the entire country have been COVID infected, um, which is an incredible statistic. Um, and it's of course, due to the fact that um, communities across the country just said, absolutely not. There, there was yeah. such a high, high rate during um, SARS. And so this time around, people were like, no. And it feels like very much part of that honoring because the stakes are so high. Um, right. That was very apparent in the, thir- the, the narrative thread around Poppy and the, and the, and the, and the choice of a, of a dictionary as a narrative form. Um, it was, it was it's obviously for posterity, pos- for posterity, but what was the process like for you of pulling that together? You know, even though Poppy is an old man, he constantly refers to the old people. So he is honouring the old people too. It just as he leaves the world and returns to them. Mm. And he, I think he is clear-sighted in how he sees his country to, his, in modern society and the fact that there's this encroaching mind at the same time that I was doing, you know, the last um, writing of it, Adani was, Adani mm. mind was used all the time and um, I just saw actually that they've blocked, blocked the roads to Adani yesterday, the community there. That's um, right. And that's his sort of, that's his way of blocking the roads to Rhine Park mining. Um it's his. It's his. It's his family history. It's, when I say that, it sounds so throwaway, um, but it's his um, sort of lifeblood that has is comes from the sort of the formation of that landscape. So it's the fact that it's all time that there, you have this magical realist element couldn't have been not been um so him passing on something as ancient as a language like the beginning of his people and the language is inseparable um and he's been taught that in his time travel with the ancestors so i i knew that the only way to for the reader to really get it would be for them to sort of be forced in a sense to learn another language Mm. to to undergo it sometimes you know you must go through slaughter um and i felt that the the reader needed to do that actually in the first edits there was a lot more work you know there was almost um whole sentences in writery Um, Mm, interesting too, too much of a burden, I think, when there wasn't a translation side by side. Some of the, yeah. um, this is a sort of a separate conversation in terms of the future of our Indigenous storytelling where, you know, um, Indigenous Literacy Foundation and Magabala Books and IATSIS actually have been publishing bi- bilingual books for the last yeah. decade or so, um, but really significantly in the last couple of years. Mm. Um especially two sisters um, mm. that's written page by page, having alternative mm. alternate um, in language and English. Yeah. And that's really a part of the future of our storytelling as well, not just the political, you know, um, movement of this black consciousness of the youth, but actually having community stories written for community in, bi- in bilingually because yep. English, is not just the is the second third fourth sometimes fifth language for a lot of these communities and i think they're left out especially the youth in these communities they're they're completely left out of that landscape of of books and literature accessibility because of language and 
why should that why should English be the prevailing language in a place Absolutely. where it, it's it's a foreign entity? It's a That's foreign right. language. Well, and and there's this beautiful there's this beautiful line you have somewhere in the book where you say, um, "Think th thinking in English changed her brain." You know that there's a way in which it's not just a language, but it's a way of our languages give us a way of being, right? Absolutely. And I had that um, Gugiwa Tiongo quote about decolonizing the mind, who said that the bullet was the means of the physical subjugation and language was the means of the spiritual subjugation. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a form of genocide. Yeah. So um, to, and it's, you know, there's a, someone else wrote about, it. isn't it odd that um, to talk about these crimes and must use the language of the criminal um, mm. So I had these, you know, I had these sentiments sort of really um, at my desk, but in my thoughts constantly, and, mm. and, and they legitimised this use of wiradjuri in the language without explanation, just to launch straight in. I was born on Nurembeng, you know. Yeah. Someone is asking how you came to the idea of the yield in the first place? Like what takes you to this moment where you're going to write this story with all these elements, with addiction? Like how do you come to the yield? Well, it started in 2005. Um, Uncle Stan Grant Senior, who is Uncle Dr. Stan Grant Senior, who's an elder, Wiradjuri elder, and a linguist, Dr. John Rudder, had you sort of revitalized the Barajo language and not saved it from extinction, but you know, preserved it. Um, and they produced a dictionary in 2003, 2005, when I was researching Swallow the Air, I came across this dictionary and a language class by, by pure accident. When I was researching Nuremberg country, visiting relatives I've never visited before, visiting missions, my, um, my ancestors, ancestors had lived and married and died on um, and I came across this language and it, to me personally I think that's why the book um, sort of shattered me and some, shattered some people is because it was totally a, a pers um, it was you know what I'm talking about so, yeah. okay because I feel like always in other countries the same thing it is you're all the guts and your lining and your yeah. heart and every single valve um is every day open. that you arrive at that page yeah you're flayed you're flayed yeah. by the flayed. yeah yeah um Absolutely. and so when I when I discovered this language that was you know denied to my father my father got the vote when I was one year old um and he didn't grow up with language, it was such a balm to me and such a way of a link, you know, to, to a cultural, a broken cultural link. Mm. It, was, it was a chink in that chain and mm. a massive one. And so I did incorporate Wiradjuri into Swallow the Air, which came out in 2006. And then when, of course, as everyone brings out a book, the first thing that you think is regret like why didn't I keep writing that why didn't I fix that book why didn't I extend that chapter or cut that and yeah. my biggest regret with that with Swalia was why didn't I why didn't May who's the main character there why wasn't she shaken more by this discovery of Bila mm. discovery of these words that she was presented with on her return to on her first um connection to country and so it was yeah. a promise that's how it came. It was a promise and a long, drawn-out promise. You know, my time with Wale Shinka was him being very angry at me, um, Kongi, being very angry at me about how, not that it took long, about my confidence, mm. about my confidence, about my self-doubt. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and everyone had given up on me, so um, in a way, you know, so people stop asking you if you're working on something after after eight years. Did you, know? you give up on yourself? No, of course you not. You never did? No, I was writing. I knew I was a writer Yeah. because everyone stopped believing. But, that, yeah. I mean, if you really have that, if it's really in your sinew, if it's coming from your marrow, you will. I mean, it's coming. Yeah, 
it'll propel you. You'll finish it. Yeah, through the self doubt. Absolutely. Just my was it little. was it really self doubt, oh, or was it something sure. else? Mm, interesting. It's just always interesting to me to hear someone who's an incredible writer talk about self doubt. It 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 for me it's an interesting uh, way of reminding ourselves how little of our self doubt is grounded in reality and how much self doubt is really about a whole range of other things. Right. Not about our actual talent or skill or ability to do something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For it's sure. Not objective. Um, yeah. It's insidious. It's um it can be a, a complete you know, it can break all your fingers, doubt. And disable yeah. your computer. Yeah, um, it sure can. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge roadblock. Um it takes a lot of work to unpack to overcome yourself. Yeah, and it doesn't matter who's telling you you're great. It doesn't matter if you've had an accolade or won an award. Every time you return um, to a book, it's it's like starting from the beginning. I feel like a complete novice, um, even with the book I'm writing at the moment. So um, what are you working on? Are we allowed, are you allowed to talk about it? Do you feel yeah, comfortable yeah. talking about it? Oh, yeah, completely. <laughs> uh, it's set in, it's about, you know, class and race and I think I'll always write about um, those issues. I'll always write about the disenfranchised and I'll always write about I think the sense of belonging to a place and mm. identifying a place. Um, so it's set in the Swiss Alps, the whitest place on earth <laughs> at sort of a five-star luxury um, hotel and it's a kind of psychological um, thriller exploration of race. It's sort of like, mm. yeah, and also N Nietzsche and the whole idea of eternal return. It's sort of like a mixture of Kafka's The Castle, um, <laughs> Ishiguro's The Unconsoled and that movie Get Out. And the shining. <laughs> Did I sell it? Can you, can someone give uh, you me sold it. I am ready to read it. I am ready to read it. I'm ready to read it. Someone is asking here, and I've been delaying asking the question to you because I, I suspect you're going to tell them that you're not going to answer it. But someone asked, what is the me what is the meaning of the of the title the yield like where does that come from right um the title i wrote to the title that came early um but the yield is so obvious for the title i think i think um it represents you know because yield is to give up and to give in so and this story is about giving up and giving in as in giving, producing, and then it was always mm -hmm. going to be, um, it was always going to be an agricultural um, yep. novel that explored history, and so the, the whole idea of, you know, erasing the surface of um, the land, sort of this um, erasing the history of the land over the surface um, with farming, and the whole idea of the wheat yield and. I knew what would be revealed within that final yield of country when it was, as you know, I don't want to spoiler it, but to, at the end when um, when the final yield, you know, the, the final dug, um, dug open, the final disturbance of that land and what is revealed within that soil, that was always yeah. going to be because that's the reality, you know, with it, the mission that I that I base this on, Warren Gesta, is that um, I'll just say the word bones. I just don't want to give away the book, but the bones. No, don't. And, yeah, and it's so beautifully rendered. When we hear, when we when we read about the bone, I feel like don't say anymore. It'll. It's yeah, just. Yeah. So yeah. yield. Um, yeah. it, it 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 means. It's so obvious that it couldn't be anything else. When I think yeah. when you read it, yeah, yeah, for me, yeah. yes, me too. <laughs> okay, last last question. 
I, and I feel like I don't, um, someone's asking what aspect of the yield was the most challenging to write. Um, was I it August story? Was it yeah. Poppy's dictionary? What was it? Yeah. Yeah, I think we touched on that it was August. Um, yeah. Completely, because Poppy's voice just felt so natural. Natural. And a lot of reviews have said, oh, I wish it was just the dictionary. And, you know, that's, I can't change what, what's, what's been published now. But I can see that um, I can see why. But I do think that the three layers are essential to tell a full, complete story that is, you know, representative of all of Australian history compounded into those five hundred acres. Um, That's right. Yeah, Poppy felt natural. It was it was my father's voice? It was my grandfather's voice? Um, it was that you know essential voice that we all carry, the truth telling voice mm -hmm. inside. Us. That tells us how to live, you know, a mm. good life at three a.m. It was that voice too. Mm -hmm. so. mm. Yeah, and and Greenleaf was the, you know, that was the that was the the history, you know, the historical voice, right? Right, and based on real letters and based on real That's experiences. Right. Exactly. So that was more of a, you know this balancing act of um, mimicry and. I guess it was really hard because the matching dates and occurrences within history to fit within Greenleaf's um, narrative was just a headache because it's not part of my writerly brain to um, numbers. So that was yeah, that was tricky. You did it beautifully. Okay, I want to end with a uh, reading out the last entry from the dictionary because it's such a beautiful choice of entry because you work backwards and you, so we end with A and the beginning is the end. So back to time because you thought everything through um, Tara June and it's just beautiful to hear, to see a writer in terms of craft who just, who tied it all together beautifully. So the, um, one, of the, one of the words that you, you just describe, define is ashamed, to have shame. Excuse my pronunciation, Giel Dure. I am done with this word. I'd leave it out completely, but I can't. It's become the part of the dictionary we all think we should carry. We mustn't anymore. See, pain travels through our family tree like a song line. We've been singing our pain into a solid thing. The old ones, the young ones too, are ready to heal. We don't have to be Giel Dure anymore. We don't have to pass that down anymore. The end of shame. Thank you so much, Tara June. What an incredible book and what an incredible opportunity to just listen to you talk. I could do that forever. I could listen. Uh, yeah, we didn't even get to talk about Boys in Another Country. Mandangu and no. Yes. Song, okay? Honestly, you have all my Yunimara. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone for logging in. And this is it. Bye.